Da 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 da. Hiya, friends. I'm Dean. Good to be here. Nice to be seen. Big show today. Frank Graves, Ecos Research uh, President, Founder. Just a weapon. He's going to join us to talk. Hold about on. I thought you politics. said his name was Kevin. No, Frank. I, I got Kevin no. down. Okay, no, no, Frank. Don't have, you got Kevin down on the on the sheet. You got Kevin Kevin Graves. Is that what you, that what you did? Dude, you're 54. That's what my mom does, too. My mom does the same thing. She's 72. Frankie. She'd be like, Frankie. Well, she's, thanks she's, for telling me this. I, I'll she's write like, down well, how's his name. girlfriend. I'm like, she's good. She, and she's like, is her name's Tracy, right? And I'm like, no, it's <laughs> totally not her name, mom, but that's okay. Don't worry about it. That's what happens when you get older. You like pull names out of hats, right? And it's like, pretty sure is his name. Oh, I'm not you know what? Bother checking. This, this isn't even an age thing with me. I don't know what is wrong with me. But if I get your name wrong out of the gates, yeah. that's your name forever. I'm never going to be able to it. look at, at at Frankie. See, I just yeah. about did it and not think that's a Kevin. And then I'll think that they named him wrong. <laughs> that's where my head goes. I'm like, <laughs> someone named you wrong. Your name's Kevin. Yeah, there are people right. Frankie. Right, that you meet and you're like, you're not a you're not a Pete. Oh. Uh, we had, a, we had a salesperson at, at the last radio station that fired me, and I met her, and her name was, I think it, I'm not even, I don't even remember now, but I remember, I remember I got her name wrong out of the gates, and I yeah. could not for the, every time she walked by the windows, and she looked like she was coming so in, I'd go to the guy, what's her name, what's her name, and then they Karen. would tell me the wrong name every time, and yeah, then yeah. I would call her, she just gave up, I, yeah. she was Amy until she left. You know, the worst part is, too, is that you let that go for years at times, right? When you meet people, you're like, listen, I'm too embarrassed. It's been like, I don't know how many years that I'm unsure of your name and I see you on a weekly basis. Yeah. So you revert to these like generic names that you call people with guys. It's like, hey, bud, dude, hey, guy, hey, dude. fella, yeah. that kind of stuff. And with women, it's like, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. yes, dear. Dear love, ma'am, which uh, can also get you in trouble now, right? Like this, you can't call anybody dear or love. You can't so wait it's anymore. never yeah. been more important to get those names right. Uh, so anyway, Frank Graves is my point. Ecos Research. He's going to join us. Uh, coming up in just a few minutes. Great guy, too. He's got some incredible stats on fault lines, polarization, disinformation in Canada. Uh, so I'm excited for that. Um, but before we get started, we Let's exist. play the video of Stacy accepting that no, award. Wait, let first. me finish. No, you're okay. out of context. Do your, do your thing. Yeah, thank do you. Thing. Let me bring people along. That's what we do. We're storytellers. Yeah. yeah. So, do one of our step. clients, really good it. friends of Lachlan Cross, former host of the locker room. They were a client of the locker room, Ardent Roof Systems. The locker and, room is still alive on the yeah. Dean Blundell podcast. That's right. So, we meet Stacy Disatel from Ardent Roof Systems who just is salt of the earth, like nicest guy in the world. And he owns a roofing company, does Eve sides. And he's like one of those guys that's so good at what he does. He's a platinum partner with one of his, uh, one of his main suppliers, Owens Corning. Yeah. So we meet him. He comes on the show, right? And it was like just minutes, felt like minutes, maybe a couple of days after he won the biggest award yep. in his industry. Now, it doesn't matter what industry you're in. And I love talking to people about business, especially self-made people that have yep. come from upbringings where they've gone, yeah, I'm a captain of my own game. I'm autonomous. I love, that's why we talk to people that own their own businesses, right? That's why we advertise. It's why we exist. Yeah, it's got a story. Unbelievable story. So the first time we have Stacy on the program, he wins this award as the number one platinum partner in his industry. Owens Western Corning Canada. Platinum in all of Western Canada. Yeah. And after he's on the show, he starts getting phone calls from people in Owens Corning going, wow, this is great. Can't believe you talked about this big award that you won. And that led to our guest today, our first guest. We've got two, correct? The guest that we have today saw this clip that Lachlan's going to play for us right now. Um, where Stacy was like so incredibly proud of the work that he did that he was top dog in all of North America, maybe Western Canada. He's top dog when it comes to being an Owens Corning platinum partner. Let's play the clip here. This is fascinating. Right. And you know what? We should do the announcement right now. Grab that trophy beside you, Stacy, and show everybody. 
All right. Let's see Arden, by the way, ardentroofsystems.com. You're looking for a quote on uh, Eve's roofs, whatever it is that you need. That is the man right there. Let's see this trophy. Exciting, too. So I just got back Wednesday night from uh, the Owens Corning Conference. They have it once a year, and they had a, an awards banquet. And I was not aware that I was even nominated for this, but ended up taking home the trophy as Canada's um, top performer MVP. So that was pretty cool. It was a Canadian. Oh my award. God! Look yeah. at that! Huh? Look at that! It was a it Canadian not, award. You were it right. Was a Canadian award. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Number one yeah. in the country, out of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and the gentleman. Uh, I think somewhat responsible for that, uh, joins us now. His name is Jonathan McSween from Owens Corning. Ladies and gentlemen, another captain of industry. The sad part of this interview, it starts with a with a hab sweater in the background. And it's, and it's proud, and it's proud behind me, boys. It's proud. <laughs> Ooh. I know it is. Yeah, uh, great to meet you, Jonathan. What do you do at Owens Corning? Let's talk about that. you got the Pink Panther there. You've got the unfortunate Habs jersey. It is a price jersey. We will, we will get to that love in just a second. But tell us what you do at Owens Corning. Uh, I, I'm essentially the area sales manager for Western Canada. So I look after Manitoba to Vancouver Island uh, for roofing. Um, I handle all the platinum and preferred contractors in Western Canada, dry specifications, deal with the contractors, distribution. And I've been with Owens Corning about nine and a half years now. So I, I've been around the block uh, for sure. Um, and that's essentially, yeah, what I do. I look after the West, uh, only on roofing. I don't do any insulation or phones. So I'm only roofing specific. Okay. All right. So tell me about this award that, that Stacy won. Um, and it, it gives you got a little smile on your face there, obviously. Well, I just watched that video again and it just screams pride and proud and, and everything. Yeah. It's, everything, it's everything we want a platinum contractor to be at the end of the day and, and be in our program. So the MVP performance award. It's just performance, year over year growth, uh, selling our platinum warranties, going to the market in the correct way, uh, you know, not upsetting the market or anything like that. It's funny, I, I did share this that video that you just posted a while ago with some of our top brass within the company, Gunnar Smith being one of them, who's our president of Owens Corning Roofing, Custer Livermore, he's our VP of sales. They were just blown away by the pride that Stacy shows. Uh, in, in the company and in Owens Corning and getting an award like that. So these are the guys that Owens Corning want in our corner. And I think Stacy would agree that he met very similar contractors that shared that pride throughout that conference in San Diego. How do you get to Stacy's level? Because it's, it's a progression, right, Jonathan? Correct. We have three tiers of programming. So essentially contractor rewards is just our basic level, preferred contractor, then our platinum. So it's it's obviously there's a sales uh, growth there in regards to volume, but it's more of a percentage in what you sell. So typically you want to do about 80% of Owens Corning roofs. We understand that there might be an odd match down the road where you have to put on a, a competitor's uh, product and that's okay. But it's our platinum warranties and standing behind our product and why you want to put on Owens Corning and want to lead with Owens Corning. Stacy was certified kind of semi-equivalent with another manufacturer before, and uh, he wasn't happy, and it just wasn't the right timing for Owens Corning in the past. But he showed a, a presence to kind of get and want to be at that elite level. And we sat down, myself, him, and Derek at, at a lunch meeting at Joey's in South Common, our favorite spot, and uh, we talked about what it would mean to be him to come into the platinum program and here we are two and a half years later and uh he just got won his first mvp mvp performance award so it's a great story yeah yeah good human being too you know like it, it's here, amazing yeah. because you know it, i think as a distributor as someone that does what you do right where your supplier is biggest supplier um, to be able to uh, work with good human beings and you see the difference, right? You got a lot of fly by night people in these industries. You have people that, you know, start up that, that, but, but, the, but the part that you, as someone who employs people or someone who has partners like him, they take the Owens Coring name with them everywhere they go, right? You know, that is, that is the kind of guy. And I've spent like a little bit of time getting to know Stacy. I'm like, oh my God, this is like, it's not, not just about, the work that he does it's the human being that he is and how he stumps for your brand and you trust him with your name right he's proud i think if you poke his veins it might come out pink rather than red like that's how <laughs> that's how much he's his, his pride is in there right so yeah. uh you look at his trucks they're all logo platinum contract preferred when he shows up to site 
We want to lead with Owens Corning. This is why. Talks about the platinum warranty, how Owens Corning, myself and the company stand behind him mm -hmm. uh, in that in that regard. He's listed as a top contractor in Edmonton, along with another platinum contractor. So when customers log into the website, that's the first name they're seeing. Um, and so that's that's kind of like the pride that he kind of takes in it. And he continues to grow every single year with our product line. So we love it. There it is right there. Yeah. Puts it on his hats. On his hats. Everything. Oh, dude, everything. Yeah. Yeah. One and, of the and, things. Yeah. One of the things. I, I, one of the things, Jonathan, I'll tell you that I know about Stacy having worked with him for quite a few years. So he was a um, title sponsor on the last show that I was on. And when I, I was um, asked to leave, he mm -hmm. came with me. Um, and the, the, one of the first times I, I ended up talking to him and listen, I don't want to take anything away from the pride that he has for the work that he does. I mean, he's successful in this market because he does unbelievable work and he stands behind the work that he does and he brings good people in, brings the best people in. He's got the best crews and there's, there's a pride in the, in the business, this side of things, right? We, we can't take that away from Stacy, but when you sit down with him, he will probably want to talk to you about one of his, his charity initiatives one of them being the golf course and then he's got the roof giveaway that he does every year um how important it is is it for owens corning jonathan to align yourself with people that give for lack of a better expression give a shit about the communities that they live in it's like 110 percent one of our most important things about giving back to the community and all our platinums do that i don't know if stacy share with you some of our uh uh, things that we do in the U.S. with our roof deployment project for the veterans down there, and we do we do a lot of those giving back to veterans in need. Uh, at the Platinum Conference itself, we just did a food giveaway for children in need in schools that not necessarily may not have lunches to go to school, or wow. like we did a, a philanthropy a philanthropy event there down there where all the Platinums were in room. So you're talking 700 people in a room building lunch bags to give back to the children in the, oh, wow. in the San Diego area. So wherever we do that, right? So our, it's very important for us to be aligned with platinum contractors and contractors that want to give back to the community. I, uh, Owens Corning sponsors Stacy every single year in his golf tournament, uh, giving back to the stallery. I mean, I'm a father of two children. Of course, there's lots, you know, anytime you hear the stallery, it hits home, right? You don't want to see children or anyone for that matter sick, but it, you know, it's, it's close to the heart for sure when you're a parent. So anything we can do to help with that and give back to the, to the, to the public and to society is unbelievable. And his roof giveaway, I mean, how awesome it would be to nominate someone who's in need that might not necessarily know that they're getting nominated or feel that they're in need. And for Stacy and his team to go in and give that customer a, a free roof giveaway, like, you know, in, in, in times of desperation and need more or less. So, it's on it's absolutely amazing what what he does i have no problem stepping up to the plate and sponsoring him neither does owens corning i share that within our organization of what he what he kind of does and to be honest with you he's kind of a leader in that category as it relates to canada uh for giving back to the community yeah, yeah absolutely not a, lot of, not a lot of people recognize um you know how important that piece is corporately uh not a lot of people invest in their community they're they're externally motivated right and so it's nice to talk to somebody like you uh, that represents a really, really big company that says, hey, you know what? Like our partners, this is not just about bottom line for us. This is about giving back to the community. This is about helping other people. This is about the holistic approach that we have with our partners. Because you don't see that anymore, Jonathan, in no. corporate Canada, corporate America. You really don't. No, you don't. And it's, 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 it's my like United Way. We give to United Way. Like every, like I know um, myself and all the managers within Western Canada give a percentage off our paycheck every single year to the to awesome. United Way, right? So that's an establishment we have set up with Owens Corn in Canada. That's mm -hmm. a, that's our main charity of choice. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I, I donate to that. Um, you know, charity is good for me. Like Osprey, I, I always share this example. So I go into Tim Hortons, and sorry if I'm getting sidetracked a little here. I go into Tim Hortons and I get say 30, 40 bucks of $5 gift cards. And I always stay at the Hilton on Jasper when I go to the hockey game. And I always take the tracks because that's where the homeless are. And the, you know, they're having a good time. I have a $5 gift card and I give one of them or two of them a gift card. To me, that gets them warm for a couple hours. They're a paying customer and they can have a cup of coffee. 
And that's a, so charity for me hits home, right? Now it's not a lot, but at least I'm not giving them cash for other things or anything like that. That's just kind of my thing that I do. Yeah. 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 One yeah, of the things awesome. about um, um, Stacy and Arden Roof Systems here in in town, and and everybody knows about the golf tournament. I just want to give that a quick little plug because early per pricing for participation, you can sign yourself up as a single, a double, a triple, um, a, a foursome by going to the webpage ArdenRoofSystems.com uh, is at the end of April. So get in on the early bird pricing. And I, I was telling Dean the other day. Um, we were talking about having you on, Jonathan, and um, and we talked a little bit about the golf tournament, about the roof giveaway. So this will be the fifth year of the golf tournament. And in four years, Stacy has raised $65,000 for the Child Life Program. Crazy. We have a... We have a date in May set up with Christy, who is our liaison with the with the uh, with the Stollery, and we're going to go film where his money has gone as sort of a bit of a presentation for the golf tournament. Now, um, I don't think Stacy. Listen, participation's awesome, and and any amount of sponsorship, even if you throw something at the at the uh, silent auction is going to be a, a help, but he wouldn't have got to that $65,000 without the support of his, his major sponsors like Owens Corning. And I know you guys step up in a big way. If I'm not mistaken this year, uh, you and one other company, I think are footing the bill for the, um, uh, for the, for, for the steak dinner, right? Is that, Correct. is that how it's working? Yeah. Us and Ken Rock are uh, splitting that uh, bill uh, to, to sponsor that for Stacy. Absolutely. So that's one of the top sponsorships. I grab, I grab that. Of course, uh, you know, Stacy is a very important customer of mine and, and this charity is, is close uh, to my heart. Yes, right. morning art. So to get, I mean, $65,000 in four years. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's incredible. It's, it's, it's a, we started this tournament. And I, I missed the last couple, couple of years because it falls on a date that doesn't align, but, I've been I've been in them and it started off as like we only had eleven or twelve holes filled. I think we're almost getting close to selling out the golf course now. How much yeah. this golf course continues to to grow, right? Mm, or yeah, or sorry, yeah. this tournament. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. It's it's awesome. It's a great day. It's probably yeah. one of the more fun tournaments of the um of the season as well. And uh we got Dean Blundell coming out too. We're gonna auction off a uh, a twosome a couple of weeks before the tournament um, for July 5th. So you'll get a chance to golf with myself and Dean. I'm only Jonathan, coming out because I got to keep an eye on Lachlan, make sure he doesn't overindulge indulge on swing oil. Jonathan, so I got a host. I got a host too. Yeah. So, he's been removed yeah. from this tournament several times. So oh, I right. have not been removed. <laughs> so Dean, you're going to get auctioned off. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. 100%. Yeah, oh, we, might, we might hit the $100,000 target here pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The only problem is you're gonna have to hang yeah. out with me for four and a half to five yeah. hours, depending how long yeah. the golf well, tournament. We're bringing some of the big hitters for that one. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jonathan McSween, Owens Corning, uh, Roofing Regional Manager, in Western Canada, uh, and uh, Stacy Disatel are putting on and sponsoring a an incredible event. It is the uh, the golf tournament, Arden Roof Systems Golf Tournament. Go to ArdenRoofSystems.com. I want everybody to go and not just put up a foursome in. I want uh, captains of industry to go and fill it up financially. I want you to donate. I'm not asking Sponsorships people. still available. Donate. Sponsorships. ArdenRoofSystems.com. ArdenRoofSystems.com. The number one partner, platinum partner of Owens Corning in this country of ours. Uh, will you come back and talk about your love of the Habs another time, Jonathan? Will that be okay with you? Can we get uh, you yeah, back yeah. here? Yeah, absolutely. I would really be a like really that. long podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really. I got, I got some history. I've been to a lot of games. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I will. I appreciate you, Jonathan. I'm it sure really he comes nice to, to the Hab games in Edmonton, don't you? Yeah. With my oh. Hab jersey on. Yes. Well, that's good, good for you. Yeah, yeah. Good for that's, you. That's why he Great loads move. up on cards to give to people, so he doesn't get beat up on the way. Yeah. Out. <laughs> oh, yeah, he, needs, he needs the Hab karma. <laughs> yeah, uh, Jonathan Owens Corning. I uh, really appreciate your time. Thanks, brother. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Take care. You Take too, care, Jonathan, Jonathan McSween. He's right, the uh, regional manager, Owens Corning, uh, and proud partner of our partner, Arden Roof Systems, Stacey Disitel, uh, putting on a golf tournament, Arden Roof Systems. And I will be there July 5th. Really excited for that. Uh, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to having yeah. you out. Uh, yeah, of course you, you can are. be as excited as you want. I'm I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. You're staying at my house. We're going to have pancakes. I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I can stay in your house. Um. 
but I need to pivot. Well, we'll talk about it in just a second because I want to get to this next guest because we've got a two guest day today. It's Friday. I chase this guy around like a puppy dog. Double your fun. <laughs> he's one of my favorite followers on Twitter. Uh, he's the founder president of Ecos Research, and he's as good as it gets, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to the program my friend and yours, Mr. Frankie Graves. Mr. Graves, how are you, sir? You're good. You're much too kind. Uh, no, I don't think I am, actually. <laughs> I think I'm telling the truth. I, I Listen, I've been a Frank Graves fan for a long time. Like your research, Ecos research, everybody like, that, that loves to know things, like he loves to look into the crystal ball. They've got their favorite researchers. Ecos has always been uh, my go-to. Ecos, uh, there's a bunch of people in that space that are really good at it. But where I really fell in love with you was on Twitter over the past four years. <laughs> well, uh you're part of a privileged group that falls in love with me. I have an equally large group of people who are not quite as enthusiastic fans, but <laughs> in fact, I was doing it a rough calculation, and if I had not blocked the people who seem to detest me, I would be one of the have one of the highest followings in Canada. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What's your block game like? What are you at? What are you at? Do you know? I, 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 I don't look at it. I just try. You know, I, I, I actually hate it when I actually did block someone accidentally. I, like I, I, I put a note out the other day. So does Dean. It just, it just gets really <laughs> underneath his skin and hurts him. You know, yeah. he can hardly sleep. It really, really bothers him. Yeah, yeah. No, there's some. Uh, I need an irony uh, button or something because I know I put out some the other day that was saying that we were going to have a record number of forest fires again this year a topic that is obviously of concern to us all, but which I pulled on for Nature Canada last year and found somewhat distressingly that, uh, although most people think there's a myriad of factors underpinning why we're having so many forest fires, the most important factor is climate change and what's going on with the uh, our climate and it's linked to greenhouse gases and carbon, all that stuff. But when I asked that question of conservative supporters, somewhat disturbingly, it wasn't uh, climate change. It was arsonist and activist arsonists who were. Oh yeah, well, they're being hired by fire. Justin <laughs> Trudeau. Uh, yeah, in his spare time, he hires people to come to Alberta and start fires. Yeah, right. It, the, the more moderate version of uh, uh, Taylor Green's Jewish space laser theory, but you know, I, so I put out a quote the other day when I I posted the story about we're going to have record forest fires again this year, and I said, "Damned arsonists." Uh, and of course, <laughs> some people thought that I was right. seriously, and they're going, "What are you doing, spreading disinformation?" Oh, okay, it's just an inevitable byproduct. Anyway, yeah, Frank, you can't you, listen. You, you can't a, troll you people for fun anymore because people take that like when you're joking. There's no tone online, right? Like people will take your text and go, "Okay, there's no tone here." Frank said arsonist, so it's got to be real. Like they'll take that a thousand different directions. But to my point. Your troll game is on point. Like, that's what I love about following you is you you don't just put out the research and we're going to get into some of it in just a second, the politics of resentment, disinformation, what it's done to people who believes what. Um, but you like to have fun with it. But these are not people that love to have fun anymore, Frank. No, no. The fun's, uh, fun's been a casualty of the new dark and polarized mood out there. Although there's still some of us trying to have the odd bit of fun out there. So, uh, Like you and me? Yeah, I think, you know, you know fellow funmeisters. There we go. <laughs> I use the backslash S yeah. when I feel like somebody might actually not hear or feel or see the sarcasm coming out of my tweet. And uh, <laughs> even sometimes that doesn't work, Frank, right? Like even if you're even if you say in the tweet this is sarcasm, you'll yeah. still You'll still get that blowback. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know I had a I had a tweet in the middle of and I was in a not a great mood when because my offices, which I'm coming from in downtown Ottawa, were right in the middle of the occupation. Uh, and I had to shutter my office for three weeks. I'd also just had a, a new hip installed, and so it was a, a bad combination of painkillers and being in a not a very good mood. But I, I remember making one, you know, offhand comment on Twitter about maybe the answer to this would be like some fire hoses. And, and I said, <laughs> quote, just kidding. But Chris Kelly, who I've now made up with, actually felt that he would write this up about how the overexcitable Frank Graves had recommended fire hoses. No, no, there was just kidding there. 
<laughs> no, but they don't. But listen, Frank. Even when you write it in there. Right? <laughs> yeah, you, you can say it's a joke. You can telegraph the joke in today's society. But we live in a world where people will tell you what you think. People, and, and not only that, they're going to come after you for not saying something that they're thinking, right? And I'm reminded of that on a daily basis. Like last week, I got it from everybody. Can't believe you're not saying this about Gaza. Can't believe you're not saying this about Israel. I can't believe, and I got something from, from the LGBTQS community. It's like, I can't believe you're not promoting the National Day of Asexuality. So we, we live in a time where you can not only get canceled or in trouble for the things you say, we now live in a time where you can get in trouble and canceled for not saying anything at all. Yeah. yeah right? Yeah, no, and I... I, I, I you know, the Gaza, you know, like I, I'm, I, I'm assiduously trying to stay away from that. I've done some research on it. It's such a, a painful episode, and there's such intense feelings on both sides, uh, for good reason. Uh, mm -hmm. That I just feel real trepidation stepping into that one. Yeah. So, but you is know, there research that you'll stay away from now, Frank? Though, like, is there research you stay away from now because you're you're worried about? Because we don't come from that time. You don't come from that time. You'd research anything. You'd give people the results. And it was, hey, this is what people are saying. Are there topics that you don't want to research now because of the heat around the cultural topic? I got a lot, a lot of stuff that I want to research. So I'm not, I don't have a shortage. That, just to go back to the example of we do have a real problem with uh, anti-Semitism and all kinds and other types of racism, which have been rising. And uh we were doing a project for a renowned scholar at University of Toronto, who's actually a Jewish scholar who is one of the top world experts. And we asked a number of questions, which were are part of a tracking used by the Anti-Defamation uh, League, which is a Jewish organization, extremely well regarded, which are trying to measure anti-Semitism. And I remember that Andrew Koch and others came out because the, they got screenshots of the research and said, this is just shameless uh, anti-Semitism. You're trying to foment racism. I said, no, we're actually trying to understand what the extent is, is it going up and down, where and why, and what can we do about it? And if you don't know those things, you're in big trouble. So, you know, that, but there are pitfalls out there. Uh, and, and the one I'm really, the topic, as you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm most interested these days is looking at the polarization of our society and the degree to that's related to a number of factors, but the most recent and disturbing one is the flow of disinformation, uh, which is also in some cases misinformation. But disinformation is where the purveyor knowingly is promulgating things which they know are false. Like, for example, you know, just to use a, a, a you know a more benign example, the idea that forest fires are being set mostly by uh, activist uh, arsonists. You know, like look. You know, conservative voters didn't wake up some morning and go, you know what, I think there's arsonists out there in the woods. Now they were told this, and we can see the evidence that there's a disinformation ecosystem which is now being curated using very sophisticated tools of artificial intelligence. Some of this emanating as a tools of statecraft from other countries, Russia's really good at it, but then getting reinforced and amplified within our own society. But you end up with things like, for example, in our most recent research, we found that 25% of Canadians now think that climate change is a hoax. It's not like, I think it's exaggerated or it might be a problem, but I don't think I can do much about it. And I work in the oil sand, so you know I'm not very much in favor. No, it's shifted from skepticism and lack of commitment to just outright, no, this is false. It's fake news, it doesn't exist. And when you've got a quarter of the country that believes this now, which is up, and we see that actually produce support for dealing with climate change. I don't want to talk about specific instruments, whether it's, you know, a carbon tax or cap and trade or whatever the instruments you want to use. Mm -hmm. The fact that you've got a group that thinks it doesn't even exist and this is new. And then you have another group of about another 10 percent that say, I, I'm not sure. But this extends over more and more to all kinds of other areas. So yeah. we found initially that, you know, the people who thought, like governments are intentionally concealing the real numbers of deaths from vaccine. Listen, I was a member of a federal task force on vaccine confidence. I'm deeply familiar with how this all worked, how we assembled the data on adverse effects. The degree of cooperation and collusion that would have had to occur for that statement to be true, you would have had to have thousands of officials at the municipal mm -hmm. level, the provincial level, 
the federal level, in the in the uh, political offices, in the uh, public health office, all all say, you know, we got to get together and sandbag the numbers of real deaths from vaccines. Mm. Otherwise, look, this is so otherworldly. Like the chances of that being true are literally zero. Yet we have a quarter of Canadians that think that's true, and you know, the, it's not just that independent. And it's not like, oh, I think the, the moonshot was actually happened in a Vegas desert, or I think the world is flat. I mean, go ahead, believe that. I don't really care. But on questions like the climate change is a hoax, vaccines, uh, governments are intentionally concealing the real numbers of deaths, or more people have been killed by vaccines and have been saved, or, you know, pick your... And the other one, of course, is more recently, we've had a big debate about, you know, uh, uh, NATO and defense funding and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we found recently that Canadians are going, you know, maybe it's time for us to, uh, you know, we have other priorities, but, you know, spending a little bit more so that we don't have this eroded position on the world stage. And because we're really concerned of the specter of what's going on in Europe, a world of scale that we haven't seen in 50 years. So we've seen support rising for increasing funding for NATO and in particular linked to maybe we should be but actually support for dealing with Ukraine, uh, which mirrors what's going on in the United States, has been declining in this country. It's still strong, but it's been declining. And again, just as support for dealing with climate change has been going down in a period where we've seen unprecedented evidence of a climate emergency, whether it's forest fires or floods or record global temperatures, mm -hmm. support is actually going down. It's not that the, the, you know, the open and informed majority are saying this isn't important. It's that you have this increasingly polarized group who are saying, no, no, I think that's fake news, it's made up. In the case of the um, uh, of, of NATO and Ukraine, it's this is really interesting. The more you believe things which are untrue, the more concerned you are with foreign interference, fine. Uh, but when we look at that question applied to say China versus Russia, the most disinformed, the people who believe more things that are untrue, are even more likely to say, like, I really don't like China. We should do whatever we can to punish them and so on and so forth. But we see the reverse pattern when it comes to uh, to Russia. The more disinformation you have, seemingly about unrelated things. We found, for example, at the beginning of the outbreak of the war in, in uh, Ukraine, that most Canadians said, oh, we got to do whatever we can to uh, help out Ukraine. This is awful. And so we asked them a list of things that we should do ranging from, you know, lethal to non-lethal aid. And, you know, we had six items and uh, most Canadians said we should be doing at least some of these things short of boots on the ground or a no-fly zone. So we thought, I thought at the time, why don't I just break this down by whether you've been vaccinated or not, which shouldn't have anything to do with this, okay? <laughs> but, we, but we found that for the 90% of Canadians who'd received vaccinations, this was a few years ago, yeah. that only 2% said, you know what, we shouldn't be doing anything in the Ukraine. If you hadn't been, if you had not vaccinated, that number was 26 times higher. 52% said we shouldn't be doing anything. Now, this group couldn't have located a Ukraine on the map two months earlier. <laughs> but suddenly, they've got all these. Uh, They're foreign them. policy experts. They were also infectious yeah, disease yeah. experts before yeah, yeah. that, too, they're, by the way. Uh, they're bioweapons and Nazis. Yeah. And the Frank, the Don Van. Sorry, I'll stop. I'm going no, to no, no. I, I, I want to ask a question that sort of ties into what you were talking about. I, obviously, you're you're following the hearings that are happening right now um, about foreign interference, and and I guess the government is trying to wrap its head around uh, what it is and, and and what to do. Um, and and I and again, this might be a a difficult question to ask. Because you're, you're you're sort of the person that collects the information and then tries to come to, you know, come to some sort of sense of idea of where we're at based on the the numbers and and the data that you're bringing in. But what do you think Canada and other countries can do about this outside influence? Um, and we're dealing with numbers now that it could have an impact on elections and things like what 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 do we do how do we combat this well that's a great question and we're making some progress but bluntly we're not even treading water the uh the the, the power of disinformation whatever the sources seems to be uh, keeping ahead of the ability to combat it we'll see for example 
And it's funny because when I ask the public, what should we be doing about these things? And they're very concerned about the problem of disinformation, whether it's from foreign sources or domestic sources. For example, I, I, I find that a, a super majority of Canadians, which transcends part of partisan lines say, you know what, we shouldn't let generative AI be used in political campaigns. That's just pretty straightforward. 85% of Canadians agree. And yet, the chances that that's not going to be used in political campaigns, it's already being used. Donald Trump has is, is got, you know, images of himself hanging around with, you know, with uh, black dudes to show that he's really favorable. It's AI generated. And yeah. we're going to see more and more of this. That I'm less concerned. Wait, are you about. saying that the picture of Trump with Jesus Christ himself is not real? <laughs> not sure. It, it isn't, it, the good one is I get pushback and I've looked at this carefully as a researcher. Yeah. I've drawn the questions that we ask about disinformation really carefully from other international sources so that I can compare what the rates are in Canada versus other countries, yeah. but also to be sure that I'm asking questions where I know the right answer. And, you know, I will get constant pushback. Well, you know, those questions, they're, you know, they're just left wing disinformation. Uh, yeah. And there's all kinds of they're right wing distance for perhaps, but there's all kinds of left wing. And I've looked very carefully trying to find, and there's no doubt that there are people on the center or left that are disinformed. But the idea that this is somehow balanced or comparable to this recent explosion of disinformation, which seems to be linked to more of the right side, at least in terms of its political impacts, is I, I, I just can't find the support for it. I don't even know. Like I, I remember the old saw. Uh, Moynihan used to say, we can all have our own opinions, but we can't have our own facts. Well, that sort of seems to be over. That's a very sad development. I'm can calling I... it an epistemic crisis and a crisis of truth, mm -hmm. which is, and trust, which work hand in hand. And it's just having horrible corrosive impacts on our democracy, our country, and it's not limited to us. And we can be somewhat, we go, oh, well, we're not as bad as the United States. Well, we're not far behind. You know, mm, it's still mm. way worse than what we've seen in the past. And most Canadians say we should do something. We should confront this. And there's some things we should do. Like we, you shouldn't be able to create an artificial intelligence fake image of someone if you want to hassle your girlfriend or whatever. You know, this 92 percent. But nonetheless, when I look at this and I break it down by those who believe in unrestricted freedom of expression versus those who believe of protecting people online. And most people think that an equilibrium both is possible. I think there's going to be real rough water in moving ahead with things like dealing with online harms or disinformation. Uh, it's, it, so, yes, this is a really a challenging problem. And we, I, I mean, to me, we need to try and find a way to depoliticize this, which is going to be difficult. Good but. luck. <laughs> well, it works. Like, I mean, you know, one of the things that, that if you go to Ecos uh, and your website, and I find it interesting, it feeds into the conversation, what Lachlan just asked you, kind of who believes what and why they believe it. The role resentment plays in the information, misinformation or mm -hmm. disinformation thieves that believe those things, right? How people are more likely to believe uh, in certain aspects of things they hear based on resentment, the politics of resentment. And you put this up at Ecos. You can go and have a look at it right now. If you go to is ecospolitics.com, you can read this article. The mood is dark. Countries divided overwhelmingly. Those with the lowest level of trust, highest levels of false beliefs are drawn to the Conservative Party of Canada. Links between mistrust, false beliefs, and support for the Conservative leader, Pierre Polyev, are massive. Like you're bearing out what you're talking about here, but I'm interested in the resentment piece because it's big in the victim industry, is it not? Mm. Yeah, it is. And, and, and like, like, you know, I do a lot of charts and I see a lot of relationships. But when you see a chart where 96 percent, I think that's the number of those who get most of these questions wrong, who, by the way, are all convinced that, they, that their level of confidence that they have the right answers is as high as those who get actual right answers. But when you find 96 percent of them are following in diet of the conservative or people's party support, you're going, whoa, that's that's a pretty powerful relationship. It's not like it's a little higher. It's like it's 10 and 20 times higher. These kinds of effects are massive. And by the way, these did not exist a decade ago. You know, we if I went back and I've done this, I've got published work looking at the impacts of not so much disinformation, but what we call 
what I call ordered populism, what others have called authoritarian populism, but it's based on questions about, you know, preferences of child rearing, which apparently on the surface have nothing to do with uh, politics. Like when you're raising a child, is it more well, it does now. to emphasize obedience or creativity? Well, they're both important. But when you get people to answer these questions, you can profile their predisposition to look at these things quite differently. And I guess the whole problem we're having is that this kind of orientation, which uh, uh, some have called, I don't like the term authoritarian personality outlook. I like ordered or epistemic populism, but it's normally a healthy part of society and it's not a fringe. This mm -hmm. is the point we have to understand that like Pew finds in the United States that 44% of Americans exhibit this type of personality orientation. And in normal circumstances, it's perfectly fine. You need these people to run corporations, to be cops, all kinds of things. But under certain conditions, it becomes triggered with a reflex that mm -hmm. some call the authoritarian reflex, which becomes extraordinarily unhealthy. They start looking around for the strong man on the horse who's going to turn back the clock, make things great again. And this whole theory, which has been improved dramatically over the last 50 years, originally was developed by scholars who came from Europe following the war, trying to understand what the hell happened, where Germany, which had been the most civilized society on the planet, descended into the abyss of the Holocaust and, and those horrors. Now, I'm not saying that that's in store or likely to happen at any point in the future, but I'm also saying when you see these sort of signals going off mm. with that level of clarity, you might want to be mindful that this could become a very bad thing. Um, and you're not the first one, Frank, that has made a connection between what's happening now and and what happened politically um, in the 30s and led to World War II. I want to I want to touch on something that um, that you were talking about in this last section there, and and I think we have we've we found a way to politicize everything, and it's frustrating when you're a content creator like Dean and I, and we're trying to you know, have balanced conversations about things. And quite often, no matter what you say, you get put in one camp or the other. And one of the things that I said, because I'm smarter than Dean, just he hasn't figured that out Whatever. yet. Yeah. Okay. I said years okay. ago, because I've been on the podcast with him for about uh, about three plus years now. And um, now like daily. And um, he hasn't asked me to leave yet. That'll come though. Now, one of the things, Frank, keep that dragging I said, these questions out and it might come sooner than you think. <laughs> One of the things that I said to Dean, because I'm brilliant, is we got to start getting voices outside of our own bubbles on to have conversations. And Dean has been a little bit more open to that, actually way more open to that in the last, I'd say, six months. And we're looking outside of our own bubble. And, and I'm in my bubble. Dean has his bubble. I'm sure you've been accused of being in your bubble, even though you're trying to collect information to educate us all. But... Do you think that will play a part in helping the situation if guys like us, this is one of the bigger podcasts in Canada, can actually chew on the idea of bringing somebody on that has a different opinion than us? Yeah, no, I do. And, you know, one of the reasons I'm here is because I think this is exactly we have to get this message out there. I mean, I've, I read a little slim book by Timothy Snyder, who I admire a lot, a Yale historian. It was called On Tyranny. It was written in uh, 2017 and he was talking about Ukraine before the outbreak but he had what he called 20 lessons from the 20th century and the first lesson of and these were how do we know if we're on a path to tyranny and the first lesson was nobody sees it coming mm -hmm. and so I'm not sure even if we do kind of act as the canaries in the in the mine shaft that it will make any difference but I'm sure as hell it's going to try and get the message out that these sorts of things if they're not confronted can become you know deeply uh, damaging um the now there's there's populism by the way which can turn out just fine i mean we have populism uh, populism is essentially rooted in the belief that there is an elite uh, uh the power there's too much power in the elites and we need to restore p power to the people uh, we got the left the right the center and you could argue that the some of the populism on the center which confronted the same challenges which emerged in europe in the 20th century and resulted in the horrible kind of authoritarian populism there, produced the New Deal and like a, a dramatic improvement to society 
with levels of innovation such as a uh, you know massive public works programs, importing a social mm. safety net from Bismarck, minimum wage trade unions, public high schools, none of these existed. They were ushered in by a form of populism. But the, when you look at the examples of the right wing populisms that have existed around the world, they all they they don't turn out well. They either disappoint those who are attracted, or they end up being you know like horrific. So I think it's important to make that distinction. I, I want to make one quick point as well, though, on the business of um, the, the we we see this type of polarization is expressing itself as what we call effective polarization. It's not just I don't agree with you on that issue. I don't like you. I don't want my daughter to date you. I don't want you living up. That's a really disturbing type of populism. And it's creeping in That's in our right. society. And I think it's driven in part by we have to be very careful. In we look at the group who exhibit disinformation, mistrust, and the tendency for many on the, who are, you know, is to go, like, isn't that awful? How, how can you be so goddamn stupid that you believe those things? And we end up pillaring them, like you think about uh, Hillary Clinton's depiction of these as a basket of deplorables. That doesn't help. And it ignores the fact that this group is overwhelmingly a group that has not done well in this economy. The whole concept of shared progress, which existed in periods where things were healthy, where everybody, you know, you work hard, you get a job, you get a house, you eventually retire in relative security, you did better than your parents, your kids are going to do better. That's all collapsed. And I believe that if you want to know how to put the genie back in the body, you have to understand the collapse of shared prosperity and the collapse of the middle class dream is, I think, what set this in motion. I think there's far other important sort of factors which have advanced it beyond that. But I don't believe we have any chance of putting this thing back. And, and I believe that if we dismiss the anxiety and concerns and insecurity of that group who feel sure. that their position in society has been threatened, oh my God, then that's what you're just going to make it worse. It adds fuel to the fire. So yeah. Elon Musk might be cheering on the convoy, but he's producing the autonomous electric vehicles. They're going to just remove some of the few jobs where a strong back is still earning a hundred thousand bucks. And to just dismiss this all as, you know, you're, you're deplorable, you're stupid. Whatever. I mean, I think that's just going to make it worse. So, so dangerous. So well, dangerous. Yeah. And, and um, I'll tell you something, uh, you know, as much fun as it is living in the dunk era where you, that's all we get paid to do is dunk on each other. Um, it also has creeped its way into academia, the 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 intellectual work that you do. You know, you can you can supply people with bulletproof receipts of your research when it comes to resentment in politics, right? But that gets internalized and personalized too. So it almost doesn't really matter, like the dunking on people, the you know the polarization of saying you're wrong. Here's why. And it doesn't really matter. I go back to, you know, getting in trouble for what you say and what you can say in your business as someone who does research, uh, one of uh, not just Canada's, but but one of North America's most most reputable firms. It has got to be impossible some days for you to look at some of this research and go, OK, this is really unbiased. Speaking of which, your resentment piece, this is really unbiased. I'm going to put this out there. But even that looks like you're dunking on people, too. So it's almost like you're never going to yeah. be able to win that discussion, right? Or ever make sense in, that, in, that corner of the, in that corner of the gym. Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's important, although they're not perfect answers. I try and put myself out in addition to the more florid material that occasionally creeps into the Twitter. I put stuff out in, in, in refereed publications where they're reviewed by experts and they are submitted to, you know, the challenges of whether or not this stuff actually does hold water and you know i think it's important to try and have that that level of, of you know of authority if you want to talk about these issues rather than just giving people your opinion sure. or, or your expression of your anxieties or views uh, i was for example i was commissioned to do a paper by the rouleau commission on the on the um, on the convoy and what were some of the structural forces that produced this and i, I was really happy to be able to do that but one of the points that I make, and whenever I'm doing this in, in my more serious research, uh, I stress that this thing will not be fixed without creating an economic narrative of hope that mm -hmm. actually deals with some of these problems, and it will be made worse, not better, by just pillorying and, and ridiculing 
the other side and they're not a fringe it's a significant part of our society yeah. and we have to be uh, have a little better understanding of how to fix this both at the level of, of public policy because that's i think ultimately where the answers might lie mm -hmm. uh, but yeah it's a, but right now uh, you know we just within the short term i think we have to figure out a better way to respond to these challenges of disinformation and you know as, as it applies to you know foreign interference in other areas as well because it's a real existential threat to our democracy yeah. so one of the th uh, questions i have about what you do um frank is is there one thing is there is there a hurdle is there a stumbling block is there something that that you feel gets in the way of you being able to do your job effectively and 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 sort of frust frustrates you on a fairly regular basis yeah i mean i i i think uh i re i you know I, in the past i have you know i, I sometimes have been a little too uh, careless and and uh, in the way I've expressed myself in places like Twitter, and it's it's had a, a damaging impact. People will use that. I still get things like I had someone digging up something, you know, the, you know, the other day on a dispute, going, you know, well, Frank Graves had to apologize about comments that he made. This was a, a twelve-year-old st uh, st uh, story that was in the Globe and Mail, and a piece from a, a Lawrence Martin article. Well, I also sort of pointed out that this was this produced an inqu uh, this produced a formal investigation by the CP, uh, CBC ombudsman at the time which is an arm's length independent agency who made a formal ruling which also appeared on the front page of the, of the Globe and Mail saying there was no evidence of bias whatsoever I was com quote completely exonerated in fact he made the, the observation that uh, that mr. Graves had actually been part of a paranoid tinge fundraising campaign by the Conservative Party of Canada at the time. And, uh, you know, so, but, you know, <laughs> people, not, still, it probably would have been better never to make the comments. But you know what, then maybe people wouldn't have paid attention. And I think having these kinds of public debates is important. Yeah. And, well, you, uh, you kind well, of hinted at it that we have to make our biggest mistakes to make the progress that we have. Um, yeah. And that's yeah, kind of and what and your no research one's exempt is. from it, right? Like yeah. everybody, everybody that that does content, everybody that puts out information, researched or opinion related, fact based, whatever we do, we all put these things out. We're all accountable for them. Like it's not like, you know, we can get away from. And, and hey, listen, this is a journey. It's not something everybody nails. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, but we live in a time where you know, being being You're unbiasedly like bulletproof or being some kind of stick in the mud that isn't attached to anything. That that's the only currency that matters. And if someone can take any part of ourselves and attach it to a bias or any part of our work and attach it to a bias, they will. And th that impressed upon me the importance of reaching across the aisle and having conversations with people. And we've recently started to do that. And speaking, going back to the resentment piece, I have been amazed when you talk to people about the disinformation they believe that they propagate, a lot of people on that side of the equation do it because they're angry about three or four other things, right? Yeah. Some of them are angry about things they don't understand. Some of them are they're angry about being called a, uh, a Nazi or a racist for not getting a vaccine. Some of them are angry because they just hate politics. A lot of them are angry because they don't frozen. make a lot of money. <laughs> a lot of them are angry because they can't get jobs. It, there are so many different variables that feed into Respect. that resentment of people that will come after people like you professionally and go, you know what? You just pierced the bubble of that misinformation, which I held to be true and I was counting on. And so I'm mad at you now. I'm going to find any way I can to make Frank Graves look bad. I'm going to find any way I can. And it's all about suggesting that everybody else is on the take. And, it, and, it, and it's amazing to me because it's that yeah. formula that is repetitively necessary in politics now that Donald Trump perfected, right? That you're seeing uh, MAGA perfect, Maple MAGA, in my opinion, is perfecting it now in certain ways where it's like, it doesn't matter what anybody says in terms of truth in a post-truth society. They can impugn someone's reputation that put out that fact to make nobody interested in reading those facts, right? That's the thing that has amazed me the most about the time that we live in when it comes to the kind of content that you do 
or any fact-based information portal when they give out that information and someone reads it they're like not only do i not want to read it i'm going to make the person that put that out look bad because they just made me look like an idiot based on the facts that they put out that i don't agree with yeah I, no that's all that's all true and i agree with it and, it's, it, and it becomes co compounded and made even more difficult by the way the information is disseminated um mm -hmm. The individuals who are drawn to these spurious views about what's going on, the impact of certain parts of social media are dramatic um, and they are not reading uh, mainstream media. They're not looking at government websites. They're getting information almost exclusively from curated information coming from places like and top YouTube's really high on that list, by the way. Yeah. And YouTube's got a, a, an algorithm driven system, which if you click on this particular piece, boy, we're going to send you some other stuff and we'll find you like that. And all of a sudden you're going down a rabbit hole being told yeah. all kinds of stuff, which is just, you know, preposterous, but you really believe it to be true. And the groups that are drawn to that are often groups that are feeling, you know, really like, I don't understand what's going on, you know? Yeah. And this part of what's seductive about this as, and it links to the appeal of dogmatism and so forth is it provides simplified answers about how, look, you know, we can go back to the way things were when everything was a lot simpler, uh, a lot more traditional, everything was more comfortable. And that's a very uh, a, a seductive kind of path for those who feel that everything has been, everything's in chaos and they've lost things because it provides, restores a sense of order and meaning. And so, yeah, I found, for example, that in some of the research we've done, we found that we've gone back to talk to people who have expressed moderate levels of disinformation. And we've told them, like I say, hey, you know, you know, this belief, for example, that governments are intentionally concealing the real numbers of deaths from vaccine. I'll give them a short explanation of why, you know, that just can't be true. And you know what? 20% of those people said, you're right. <laughs> and, you know, so we can't just give up and say, now this question is, how do you find a way to provide a safe, quiet place to provide those types of engagements with those people? I'm going to tell you, the people who are in the upper 10%, they're radicalized, you're not going to reach them. And no, there's some evidence yeah. that they actually exhibit different personality orientations than others. They, they actually uh, ha are actively seeking chaos mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. have high levels of... Uh, that lack conscientiousness. And we measure this with survey questions, like these type of people will say, oh, you know, I actually enjoy seeing a disaster in a foreign country. You know, you know how do you deal with that? You, you don't. You, you have can. to figure out how to insulate yourselves from the, them promulgating those who can be moved. And there's a moderate group who are, you know, I think reachable, their their beliefs are plastic, plastic, plastic and we just have to get, and we have to get better at doing that. But as I say, I go back further and say, if you don't come up with a an economic narrative, a plan uh, to restore shared prosperity, which existed for a long time, uh, that and I, I look to the south where Mr. Biden's talking about you know massive investment programs being fueled by wealth taxes, being fueled by higher taxes on corporation, uh, maybe raising taxes on those who are making more than four hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, why not? That group has been accelerating away from the rest of the pack at a rate which is a, like the average GDP growth in upper North America in the 21st century has been around 1%. In that period where between the, the New Deal when it emerged and, you know, it sort of sputtered out at the end of the 70s, there was another spurt. The growth rates at that point were an average of 6% compounded annually and disseminated in a way that everybody, poor people moved ahead, middle class people moved ahead, rich people... But what you have now is this tepid growth is all being appropriated by a tiny fraction at the top of the system. And, and, you know, I think we find, for example, young people are going, that doesn't work. You know, that whole model, which came in, you know, in your neoliberalism at the end of the last century, it just didn't work. It was a hoax. You know, we're it doesn't all make them communists, though. Right. Yeah. Like that's that's where I think we're that that's where we're getting into trouble. It's the messaging uh, people that are stumping against these things are automatically considered, um, uh, you know, extremists. And and uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Well, no, no, that's the first right. point. You have to push back because, yeah. like, I'm a capitalist. I've run a business and paid a payroll for over 30 years. 
And I believe in, in uh, democratic capitalism or liberal capitalism. I think it's the best. I am not a socialist. I'm not a communist. There's parts of socialism I'm okay with, but I'm certainly believe that, and you'll find that if you look at the economic literature, that economies, uh, I refer you to things like Darren Asmoglu, Why Nations Fail, or Robert Gordon's The Rise and Fall of American Growth. Liberal capitalism works best when it's inclusive and people feel that if I work hard, yeah. if I create yes. a better wealth trap, I'm going to go ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. But where you feel that, like, okay, my first job a long, long time ago was in a bank. The president made 20 times what I did when I took that job. Uh, and I thought, you know what, maybe if I work hard, I can be a president someday or whatever. But that system was fine. If I went into that job today, it doesn't make 20 times, it makes 400 times. Yeah. By the time I go for my first bathroom break, he's made more than I'm going to make all year. That is not a motivator. No. This, and I'm not talking about yes. socialism. I'm talking about incentive systems that spur people to be productive, inventive, uh, all those things. And those are, I think, under real stress with the system we have today. Well, it's easy then to see how populism could be a good thing for us right now. It's easy to see how we could get people from both sides, any side. And I know I don't like both sides either. I know you're not a both sides guy. But it is super easy for me to understand. Listen, in a divided Canada, what is going to unite people? It's the idea that that guy makes 400 times and, and, and a multiple of whatever it was back in the day. It's the idea that runaway banks are, are still screwing us. The idea that we pay way too much for chicken. It's the idea, like it is the elites. And I know people get mad at the elites and I'm a capitalist through and through. I'm an entrepreneur. We all are. And it's really important to me to do business the right way. Right. So sharing wealth, sharing that around in a, in a responsible way is something that I understand. But I also understand to the victor goes the spoils that your life is a meritocracy. If you do the work and you do good work, you should get paid on that work. I get it. I totally understand that. But That's going back to the commonality that we all share and we shit on the word populism the whole time, I am firmly in line with populist movements. Like the scary part for me, I'm watching this Alex Jones clip this morning because the Liberal Party put out the, hey, Alex Jones says this, Pierre Polyev says this, they're exactly the same. And it was talking Fox. about global elites and how there's too much money in the hands of very few people. And I'm like, that resonates with me, right? But it's what they say after that to kettle a group of people. It's all the other little things that they bring into that equation. So I find it impossible now to be able to silo that as a conversation with people to say, hey, listen, we're all populists at heart. We all want the same things. We don't want people to take our tax money, give it to their friends and their relationships so that they can continue that circle of populist elite trust and continue to keep certain people away from wealth and influence in this country. Isn't it easy then for us to see where that united button is that we need to push, right? Yeah, to no, me? I, I, no, I, I, I Listen, I'm, I agree with you that populism, which in its essence is a strategy for achieving power. That's what populism is. Yeah. But it's, it's, it, it's ideologically thin. There are expressions of populism across the left, the center, and the right. And as I said, the populism that produced the New Deal and the Roosevelt's were definitely populist. Fireside chats. They went after the elites. Remember, before... Franklin Roosevelt could usher in his new deal. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt engaged in trust busting, dismantling oligopolies, mon monopolies. And this was not, in fact, something which was pandering to the elites. It was, in fact, breaking down that system and renewing it with a new middle class model. Yeah. So, yes, that but I, I just want to say my view is that this particular form of populism, which we sure. see expressed on the right side of the spectrum, it, it doesn't, it never turns out right. Trojan right. horse, right? It's a Trojan horse. That version of populism is a Trojan horse. But yeah, I, I think just, part yeah. of the issue is, I think it's who's sending that message and, and they're not doing it well. And, and that's, that's what I'm seeing right now is the people that we have in power are messing up so badly. They're just adding to the division in in the country, right? Like, listen, I, I hate yeah, making yeah. it political, but you know, you know, I hate bringing this up. But when Justin Trudeau is on my TV, I'm sorry, I got, I got to turn it off. And it's just 
what even if you're on the right side of things, it's funny you mentioned something that I was saying when the convoy started. This was not a fringe group. Listen, there may not be everybody in Alberta in their cars and trucks heading to Ottawa, but this is not a fringe group, people. This is much bigger than you think, and it is growing daily because of a lot of the things that you said, and you say it a lot better than I was ever able to, um, but I was I was witnessing it. And that's the thing. That's where we're at right now, Frank. When we bring people on, I'm like, Dean, this guy has a very interesting perspective. When he was, when, when COVID hit, yeah, he wasn't an anti-vaxxer, but he was trying to do business and travel around the world. You got to hear a story. And then you hear a story and you're like, you're right on board. You're like, I get why you would be frustrated, right? Yeah. So I think that's kind of where we're at right now, where we're we're lifting the lid off of a lot of these conversations we should have been having two, three years ago, and we're now getting to the meat of it, right? Why is that guy in that camp? Why is that guy so um it, how did you, know, you get there? That's why like is he one pushing of those like, back so much against well, it's one of those things that, that we all can share is how did you do arrive at your yeah. core beliefs about what you think is going on, right, Frank? Yeah, yeah no, I, and I think there there's some evidence that providing safe listening spaces to have a, a conversation in which you can inject some information, allow people without being attacked and yeah. without being ridiculed. I'm trying to do some research which doesn't do the conventional type of polling where we we just call up and ask you to answer the questions we thought of. We actually will inject some information to allow the respondents to understand some basic facts, which are non-controversial. And then they are allowed to not just say, well, I agree or disagree, but can you give us some advice so that we can tell decision makers how they can move forward? Because we have a consensus in this country. People say that the levels of polarization and disinformation are bad. They, even this, if, this even regardless like, of what side you're on. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's like saying the same 85% thing. 85% <laughs> of Canadians say this is bad. We got to deal with this. That transcends partisanship. So we have to find a better way. And it, it, I think if I can make a contribution, it's by trying to understand how can we penetrate some of the disinformation and how can we po- provide safe spaces so that we can get some ideas going forward. Like, you know, like for example, the idea that maybe we need to level the economy or at least provide something which you know provides the you know, we get a balanced budget. Sure, like I mean, I noticed that Biden's proposals are going to pro- provide four point eight trillion dollars to fund this project. He's not going further into debt. The Americans are further in debt than they should be. But it's it's all being funded. I mean, and and by the way, the support for the kind of measures he's talking about, which are wealth taxes and increased taxes on corporations, which were all much higher in this era where you know growth rates, GDP rates were five six percent, not the miserable one percent we see today. The support for that in Canada is eighty percent. Mm. You know, I kind of go scratch my head. Why aren't we doing this? You know, I mean, I wonder why more why more a more why a political center or political that. group decided to get behind <laughs> that messaging. It's like. Oh my God, that means you might agree, and oh my God, that might take the wind out of your angry sails. It's uh, maybe where we're at. those Frank businesses Graves. have a stranglehold on politics in this country. <laughs> yeah, some do. Some guy um, comment, but yeah, Frank. Uh, last but not least, uh, before I let you go, Frank Graves, uh, Ecos Research President, Founder. He's a great follow. Follow him on Voice of Frankie. He's online. Uh, go to ecospolitics.com. You can learn all about Ecos Politics. The last question I wanted to uh, the last question I wanted to ask you: um, When you do your polling, like when you put these things out, when you when you actually uh, put out the information and you're getting the information back, my theory used to be when I like to dunk on people was that only crazy people spend 20 minutes giving answers to somebody about something. So it's like, is it weighted in favor? Some of those answers, do you weight those because you've got people from one side that are rabid that want to control the narrative through research or how do you like, how do you account for that? How do you account for culture and the people who are willing to give you answers because they're like, I'm on this team. So if my information for Frank's research can help spin that weight, does that a thing? Is that a thing that happens in your space? It is, and we don't have the time, and I would probably bore everybody to death if I got into, I teach a graduate courses, graduate course in survey methodology and yeah. statistics and probability. And I've done a lot of work. I've published on this. I just presented at a conference in Washington recently where we're looking around, groups around the world are trying to figure out 
how do you get scientifically accurate samples? Yeah. And let me just tell you, it can be done, but it's really challenging. And it costs a lot more money to get them properly done. I'll give you one quick anecdote, Please. which was presented at the conference where I presented. I was in the opening session. And I, I, I was talking about how do you represent not just different demographics, but this group of institutionally mistrustful people. And I used as a proxy the underreporting we have of people who said that they stopped at two vaccines, which is actually 30 percent. But all of a sudden it was showing up. at 20. Anyway, I'm not going to get into all that. But on the same session, Pew presented on some research they'd done, which had looked at some research, which and I'm not a fan of what's called non-probability methods, where you put a sign up on the Internet, you know, would you like to do our survey? You know, it, it's very inexpensive and it can be OK for certain applications. But frankly, I like to have a methodology which says I'm going to randomly sample from a framework. I know everybody's in there and then I can select them using random probability and I can make various adjustments. They looked at some research uh, that had been done by YouGov, a very large, well-known outfit that had been published by The Economist. And it showed that I think 30% of young people no longer believed in the Holocaust. Pretty shocking. Jesus. Pew said, you know what? That doesn't sound right. So they went out and did some follow-up research using probability methods, which is all we use. Everything we use is random probability methods. Yeah. And they found that, and they compared it to the non-probability methods, and they found the incidence of people who were saying they thought the, inter the, the, the Holocaust was a hoax wasn't 30%, it was like 3 or 4%. That's pretty shocking. By the way, just to check it a little further, they asked other questions such as, are you qualified to operate a nuclear-class submarine? <laughs> okay. They had 12% in the non-probability sample. You bet I'm qualified to operate a nuclear. Guess what? These aren't even people. These are bots. These are click farms. Yeah. They are like AI generated stuff. And that's that's a big specter. We have to be careful to disentangle. Yeah. So yes, you can get the research right, but it's gonna, you know, like in the United States, for example, the government in the United States, they, they only buy probability methods. It's, and I think, you know, this is something that we really have to pay attention to. It would bore everybody to tears if I got into Oh no, it. I want to have you back because I want to know about this because like that's the yeah. problem that people have and it answers that by question. I absolutely so. and the scientific accuracy of property done pulling today is actually as good or a little better than it was 30 years ago mm. in the salad days when you know 70 percent of people answered the phone it, you can yeah. do it it's harder but you can do well, it well uh, uh, i don't have a landline so i'm out frank graves ecos research uh ecos politics uh dot com i believe is the name of it. let me just get that ecos politics dot com politics resentment frank I, I can't tell you how much i appreciate having you on how yeah. you, you've given us so much time today uh and your energy and your information continued uh good health good work and uh, hopefully you'll come back again sir i, I would love that thanks guys thanks have buddy a great day. Uh, you too Take care, frank. Have a great weekend frank graves in ottawa President of Ecos Research. See, I love that conversation. That was so. Conversation. That was amazing, and I wanted to add this because I, um, I think Frank would find it funny, and it'll be really quick. I did a survey a couple of years ago locally, on the phone. All right, and it was just it was for Edmonton and area. Stop, stop it. They called me Please back. Hold on. They called me back last night, and I yeah. noticed I recognized the number, oh, and already. I picked up. Oh. I picked up. Do you know why? No. Because I was drunk. Yeah, right. And I and the and the woman asked me a question about the last time I picked up and I was like, "Oh, that's right." Cuz they want to know whether or not they can keep calling you back. And I yeah. told her on the phone last night, I said, "Well, I must have been drunk the last time you called cuz the only reason I would ever pick up the phone to answer a survey is if I've got four or five beers in me." <laughs> That's a true story. That happened oh, last night. That hey, happened last night. You know what? I I you imagine Frank that. Graves is smiling somewhere, listening to that story, going, "Yeah, we yes, I will a answer your questions. Shoot. I'm <laughs> yeah. gonna not only that, I'm gonna help everyone tonight. <laughs> I make more sense right now than I've made all week because I am twelve in. This is going to be a great research project. Thanks to Frank Graves, Ecos Research, Voice of Frankie on Twitter. Uh, he's a great follow. He really is. We need to get together. We need to get together and start talking about these things and not allowing the fringe to control certain conversations on either side. That's all I'm saying. I loved Frank. That was awesome. Yeah, we'll sorry. skip the retro replay of the day today because yeah. we've gone yeah. a little bit long. And we um, gave Arden a great big handy at the start of the whole thing, yeah, too, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Ardenroofsystems.com.
the webpage to sign up for the golf tournament, which Dean is coming out for at the Ranch Golf and Country Club on Friday, July 5th. That's it for me. All that right. was a really good one. I, I, uh, yeah, we need to have Frank back. That was yeah, unbelievable. He'll come back. He'll come All back. Right. Good to see you. Have a great weekend. That's Lachlan Cross at Lachlan Cross, where you can find him on Twitter. I'm going to make way for my friends at Scouting the Refs. Maybe the best podcast that uh, you need to start listening to. Bunch of guys like Todd Lewis and his crew talking about referees in the NHL. It's a huge podcast. I'm going to make way for these guys. I want to thank some friends that uh, have made this whole thing possible, including my buddy Colin at Cantork, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. They make rugged, hardworking torque wrenches. Uh, one solution, one roof, all your solutions, one roof. Doesn't matter what they are. If it's a bolting solution that you need something for, they make the best in the world for heavy industry around the world. Go to Cantork. Torque.com. Uh, for more information today, check out all their products. Brand new website. Also, our friends at Muse Massage Spa. Oh, Emily and Riley, they're lovely. They got a great podcast called Muse on the Mic, uh, sexologist, educators, and they're also the owners of the number one body rub parlor in all of Canada, Muse Massage Spa.com, right here in Toronto, 1290 Finch Avenue West. Go to Muse Massage Spa for more details and the $50 Dean discount. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, also, make sure you upload and download their podcast anywhere you get it, including Patreon, Muse on the Mic, as well as YouTube, Muse on the Mic, sub to their podcast. They're lovely ladies, educational entrepreneurs that absolutely champion your ability to enjoy your life and your body as you wish. Also, we're brought to you by factcheck.io. Uh, misinformation and disinformation, as you can tell by this entire podcast is systemic it's a pandemic and the good people at fact check computer scientists data scientists journalists evolutionary psychologists have figured out a way to give you agency over what you read all epistemology pathology of the truth and a lie sources social media origins it doesn't matter they'll give that power to you uh it'll be like a little buddy you take with you on your phone little buddy you put in your browser and a place that you can break ties start fights go to factcheck.io to join their beta test team today have a great day everybody really appreciate it don't forget to rate subscribe the podcast anywhere you get your fine podcast google apple spotify etc uh and you can find us on youtube dean blundell show on youtube as well as cryer media youtube have a great day thanks for watching thanks for listening We'll see you fine people on Monday. Bye.